So welcome Nathan Lee. Contexture is a noun that refers to an interwoven structure, a fabric. My work weaves together threads of place, history, culture, and ecology into playful, richly layered objects of art and design. My work emphasizes simple, elegant, and sustainable design and is often inspired by materials and place with historical or environmental significance. I celebrate overlooked natural and cultural systems with a heavy but light approach, which seeks to engage meaningful social and ecological concepts with humor and whimsy. By understanding the unique qualities of site and materials, my projects are on one hand, refined and richly laden with local meaning, and on the other hand, buildable, durable, and responsive to the practical demands of public art. So welcome, Nathan Lee. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so Nathan, actually in your like artist statement, um, you, there, you, you've covered sort of the way you approach your art and, and design, but maybe you can just give us a, like a quick little background on your education and, um, and maybe the steps that got you to. I would say I, I've had, uh, like a, probably a non-traditional, um, uh, art background. Um, I went to school in landscape architecture. Landscape architecture is kind of about the in-between places. So architecture is about buildings and the, the places that we inhabit from an interior perspective. And then urban planning is kind of about these, these um, the larger scale and the, maybe the, the fabric of the city or an urban area. And, and landscape architecture kind of falls in between. So it's like it's about the, the in-between places. And that's sort of what really appealed to me about it. After graduation, I um, realized that it, it wasn't really the discipline that I was attracted to. It was more the creative act. So um, I co-founded Contexture Design with Trevor Coghill, um, sort of a old friend and uh, like-minded person that uh, we worked really well together. So um, we were really focused on, on um, I, I think it was probably more like industrial design. Uh, we were looking a lot into materials and manufacturing and um, I, I guess like a kind of an artisanal approach to, to making, th making things for, um, for market. We were, we were looking a lot at, um, at, um, industrial industrial waste waste from manufacturing um, and repurposing that into um, things so one stream that we were able to repurpose was um, veneer from uh, local cabinet makers so there was mm -hmm. a lot of veneer offcuts that were kind of at a, they were at a size that they weren't um, they weren't feasible for them to use but they were as a size that we could make small things so we were we made um, we made a laminated uh, cuff um, that was kind of, uh, the form was kind of reminiscent of, of a Java jacket sort of thing. So um, uh, yeah, it was a coffee cup. So it could kind yeah. of like exceptionally work as both. And then didn't you do some bird houses? Yeah, they were about habitat and they were about um, sort of urban habitat. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then also sort of, you know, like they were kind of like trying to, trying to build the the most beautiful birdhouse that we could possibly make and the, the most well-crafted birdhouse that we could possibly make kind of um that was the idea it was about mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. um making habitat um sexy I guess yeah and then how did how did you transition from doing these types of little not or smaller scale design mm -hmm. projects to a kind of more art uh, an art approach and public art sort of um, practice. Yeah, so I, I would say that our projects were slowly moving away from uh, from product design and more into conceptual design. So, so we were kind of getting into um, design challenges um, mm -hmm. that often 
had reclaimed material. So they, they weren't, they weren't um, production pieces. They, they were like one-offs. So and was this, was this like, um, there would be a design challenge posted mm -hmm. or a call, like an artist call yeah. to, to do something. And then you were like, oh, that'd be cool. We, we are going to mix our kind of industrial design yeah. process with art. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of the calls were coming out of, um, I think reclaimed materials was quite, was quite big at that time. So um, if you think back, this was a time when fry tag bags were kind of coming onto the scene and, right. and mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. like IDS West would sort of every year, they would have a design challenge and um, they would kind of have a different material and, and, mm -hmm. you know, what can you do with an old phone booth kind of thing. And so, so IDS West is, what's oh, that stand for? International Design Show West. Um, in for Western Canada, right? Western Canada. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then what did you do for them? Like what, what was like something that sort of like was cool, but it was more on the art tip. Well, we did a project called home phone that was about, um, you know, every, every team was given a phone booth. I mean, it was, about, it was about homelessness in Vancouver and that it still is a really hot topic and it's something that's kind of gripping the city and mm -hmm. um, a really important topic at the, at the time it was, we were seeing uh, cell phones um, rising in popularity and phone booths were disappearing because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because we didn't need them anymore. We were carrying them around in our pockets, whereas before you, if you had to find, make a call, you had to find a phone booth, but um, the disappearance of the phone booth like really um, didn't affect a lot of people, but it affected marginalized populations more because they couldn't afford, the cell phones were really um, expensive at the time. So it was kind of making this connection between like, um, if you if you treat the phone booth like a public amenity and not like a convenience thing like mm -hmm. who does it affect the most when it gets removed and it, it actually has a huge had a huge effect on the homeless population because that was their line of communication to um, the outside world that was not directly um, within their community conceptually could you make this into a home so we made it a small home with in a three by three phone booth and like, you know, what if you were to duplicate these? And what if you were to like, um, you know, have one that was a shared kitchen and one that was a shared bathroom and could you repurpose? Them? So it was kind of this like super conceptual idea of like um, connecting the, the loss of an amenity with, uh, with this other public health issue and sort of putting the two together from a, from a housing first model of, of public health. Right. And what about the canoe piece? So that project was about, it was, a, it was a similar, it was a design challenge. And the challenge was uh, to repurpose the old um, sales from Canada Place. So mm -hmm. um, it had been 25 years since Expo 86 and the sales, their super industrial material um, needed to be replaced. And so um, that was the design challenge. What can you do with these sales? And that project was, um, it was a super fun build that was about place in a weird way too, because it was all about Canada place and like the significance of Canada place mm -hmm. was built for Expo 86, which mm -hmm. was all about transportation and the canoe as, as a means of transportation, but then sort of canoe being, you know, also intensely Canadian, um, the rivers were the highways before and mm -hmm. this transportation hub um, you know, was laid on top of the framework of a pre-existing transportation hub. It was a lot, again, about making those connections between these, these different ideas and sort of weaving them together. That's a really interesting kind of step, stepping stone to then what, then what happens? Then I applied for what, like a couple of public art um, projects along with some landscape architects that um, I've been working with on some some other things. Um, I think Trevor at this time uh, had moved to, Victor to um, Vancouver Island. So um, Contexture was just me. Uh, it still mm -hmm. is just me. Um, and, uh, and I think I was exploring sort of, uh, yeah, more public art opportunities and landed a couple of them. And it turned out to be a really great fit for me and for my process. I think maybe it appeals to the designer in me as much as the artist in me because it's you you know you get a brief and, and it's about a place and it's like what can you what can you make that's about this this mm. place and so the parameters uh, are usually pretty defined um, and 
that's really helpful to have what your parameters are. And the problem is usually really well defined. So it's something that, um, like for me personally, it's it's a it's a unit that I can attack. If you choose it yourself, you're often going to choose the easier solution. But if it's mm -hmm. not chosen, if somebody else chooses it for you, it puts you outside of your comfort zone. And you mm -hmm. have to try new things, and you have to like explore things that you're less familiar with, and that's a growing experience. Yeah, but so, like I would imagine that it's uh, very satisfying. It's actually really great to to listen to your trajectory because you know how do we fall into these really weird, unusual jobs that mm -hmm. you know you have found yourself in? It's not an easy. It's not an easy road. Like it's a very hard. Um, like public art is actually a really difficult. It, it's I think in some ways a lot more difficult than other types of art because. Um, there's usually bigger budgets. There's a lot of uh, shareholders that are involved in mm -hmm. whatever it is. Like it could be like, you know, private business development, um, public, the public. Yeah, so. it's definitely an animal unto itself. It comes with its own opportunities and also its own constraints, um, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, everything has to be bulletproof. Um, you, mm -hmm. the, 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 I, I don't make a lot of things myself anymore. Like the mm -hmm. canoe was a project that, you know, we we crafted that thing. Every piece of it was done with our, it was like- It was you guys. Hand tied together this with sinew and, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, and every, it was us building it. Um, but I can't do that anymore. I, the public realm dictates a certain level of robustness that you can't make delicate things because it because public art is public um you 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 know as an artist that you're not going to be able to satisfy everybody's yeah. um wishes so you yeah. must have like thick skin because i'm sure there's a lot of criticism like there's always yeah. criticism yeah. like you can put up anything so you might as well like make the thing that you really want to make because you know people are going to gun for you <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. Up. It is for sure that um, that is. I, I think that took me a really long time to get used to. Because um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there is a, a lot of scrutiny, and especially because sometimes they're public funds that are so. You know, mm -hmm. there's always the argument of like, why did we spend you know so many thousands of dollars on this when there are people starving? Um, and it's true. Like mm -hmm. we have our own problems, but they're different problems. And I like, I've always looked at it as like, if we're, if, if it's controversial, it means we're talking about it. And that's the, the per that's the purpose. What was one of the most challenging issues you've had as a, a public artist and how did you deal with it? What did you learn from the experience? Um, I think probably, well, I, we've, we've sort of talked about before about having work, um, in the public realm and mm -hmm. what that means in terms of criticism and putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a challenge um, to be okay with that level of public criticism. Really? So that was that was the thing that you-, you Oh felt, yeah, 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 for oh, sure. Okay, okay, was, that's interesting. Public art is weird in, in some ways because it's in the public realm, but it can be funded by a municipality, but it can also be funded by a developer. Yeah. And um, that puts, that's a weird spot to be in. So, um, you know, a lot of times it was about um, kind of finding um, subversive ways to criticize things that are going on. And like, if you're gonna criticize development on, on a site that's being funded by a developer, like that's a challenging place to be in terms of how your message gets. gets yeah, I'll there. say like so challenging. Like Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You don't so, want to bite the hand that feeds you, but exactly. at the same the same time, though, um, who who do you think is doing a good job of that? This always kind of gets thrown out as an example yeah, of but. of good public art, but the East Bank Cross is like pretty is pretty awesome by Ken Lum. Yeah, I like that that project. <laughs> that project amazes me that it was built and that it was able to be um, done with the dollars that came like one of the sort of stories around that piece is that you, you know it was this 
um, little piece of graffiti that was on site and Ken Lum sort of found this graffiti. He's from East Van, so he kind of understood the significance of that little East Van cross that kind of shows up everywhere mm -hmm. and then supersized it and, and put it as kind of this monument, this gateway and threshold to East Vancouver. Mm -hmm. that's, and, that's a very current monument, right? Yes, that would be yeah, of our time. So, the, so the, anyone that's of our time was like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, the crazy and like, abs I find absolutely astonishing thing about that is that the East Van Cross was also um, like a gang sim symbol for the Clark Parkers. Right. So uh, they were like back in the days of gangs being like, um, you know, not having huge arsenals, but like people walking around with baseball, but like seven guys walking around with baseball bats and two by fours versus like people walking around with semi-automatic weapons. But the Clark Parkers um, were a gang, an old East Vancouver gang. So like Ken Lum somehow got Olympic money uh, to promote an old gang symbol and put it up in lights Mm -hmm. um, on the edge of um, East Vancouver, which but it's but it's a it was a sign that was co opted by that community to to um, show pride, right? Yeah, and so absolutely. he was able to totally sell that idea, which everyone understood. Who understands? Like when you saw it, if you understood it, you got it right immediately. It's about pride. It wasn't about the gang, right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I, the that is totally true. But if you were to like, if if the if you were to dig deeper into that, and if somebody was to make that connection with the gang, it's like like that piece would have been like, I don't know. In some climates, that piece would have been unmakeable with the with the place that the money was coming from. It's like that's a home run. That's a, that project is a home run. Absolutely. Yeah. I know. Whenever I see work that's in that, you know, at that you know, that does, is able to um, uh, be successful in that way. It's just like, yeah, but you know what? I know there's a lot of people that would disagree with me. And there would be a lot of people. And I think they're, they're probably like, it is, it is a piece of work that now has a following and it is now, I, I think it like, you know, exemplifies or, or has become a symbol of the community, but like there, there surely were a lot of people when that, idea came out that was like this is graffiti you know you're talking about reproducing graffiti you're talking about reproducing vandalism yeah. um and that would be one way to take that and sure that's valid we're talking about the public realm and we're talking about pride and graffiti mm -hmm. and all those things are all wrapped up in that so great mm -hmm. we're talking about those things so that's mm -hmm. a success that's a win oh yeah it's such a win i think a lot of the arguments come down to funding and i'm much more confident in defending um defending having beautiful spaces and defending having um, access to art in, a, in the public realm and that people should be challenged. But if you think about them, all the most um, successful public art pieces around the world, they, they actually bring a sense of intense pride to the city. Um, they make the city identifiable immediately from an, any other city because they have these pieces that um, that are screaming out that this is Absolutely. this is our place, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is there is um, you know like a lot of people use the term activate the space and mm -hmm. and that activation can, be, can become quite global in scale. Where do you sort of um, go for inspiration? Do you have like a, you know certain like books or oh I see yeah like what where do you where are you trying to collect some ideas where do you it's, go my work is place based so mm -hmm. um, it's always about the site so it starts and ends there um, whether or not it's like the physical properties of the site or the light or the aspect or whatever or the history of the site like I I do a lot of research um, mm -hmm. historical research um, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the archives. So you kind of have to have, to do this job well, you kind of have to have like the ability to be a good communicator. I think it's about servicing the, the, the project and servicing the concept. So a lot of times it's about leaving your ego at the door. It's not about you and it's not about your work. It's mm -hmm. about 
the peace. So mm -hmm. um, if everybody can do that and just service the work, then, um, then you're in a good place. Can you tell me about the Megaphone project? So I did that project when I was at HAPA Collaborative. I joined HAPA Collaborative, which is a landscape architecture firm, and I was kind of starting up an initiative, a public art initiative within the firm. Um, we're, we're calling it HAPA Lab. You know, again, it was kind of like a, a design brief, and um, the, the city had just built um, the Jim Diva Plaza um, in the West End, and so Jim Diva... Um, he was a community activist, outspoken about public speech, and um, and he was a bookstore owner. And a lot of his uh, books were being stopped at the at the border um, because they had gay content in them. Um, mm -hmm. So they were they were, you know, they were being labeled as as pornography, and they weren't allowed to be imported. And and so there was this, you know, really long and drawn out legal battle of like censorship and free speech mm -hmm. um and you know he was he was a pretty amazing guy you know and and uh, quite an advocate for free speech so the city wanted a, a soapbox of some kind our idea was the, was was the megaphone and mm -hmm. kind of the idea of you know what if what if the soapbox wasn't a box that you stand on, but what if it was something that you stand in and, and you stood inside of a megaphone and it projected, yeah. you know, your sound out. And then how do you layer other <laughs> programming elements on top of that? Like, um, can it be a stage and can it, you know, um, you know, we had drawings where you could put like an amplifier at the back of the megaphone and it would sort of project out, or you could put a bubble machine at the back and it would, you know, mm -hmm. you know, span, bubbles I'll spew bubbles out all over the plaza but um uh but yeah that was that was kind of the the root of that project I and I'll be honest that is a project that I'm in I'm really proud of the way that that project turned out considered myself really lucky to be a part of that project that's so tell me about the project welcome to the zoo that is a new project um so it's just the site's not actually even done yet but the the artwork has been installed oh um, wow so that was in um New Westminster mm -hmm. um and it was um it's in Queen's Park in New Westminster which is uh yeah Queen's Park was kind of um was the first provincial park uh in in BC and it was really um it's kind of labeled as this, this park for the people and it was set aside because of its kind of um untouched and majestic beauty fast forward you know like 10 years later and it was the home of the like the I guess it was the p &E equivalent um and it was an agricultural fair so a third of the site was mowed down and these giant buildings were put on the site kind of lost any habitat value to it but then at the same time um this pet project from uh the the fire hall that was just up the street um mm. was was a zoo they built as they had a zoo that was in at the fire hall and then eventually moved it to Queens Park, um, really close to the site of the artwork is right now. Um, but the first inhabitants of the zoo were two bears, and two cougars and two deer mm -hmm. and uh, two coyotes, which were essentially the natural habitat that was there before mm -hmm. um, it became a park. So it's ironic. It, it for sure is, <laughs> but I think it's like, the the part about it that's that I find really interesting is like putting yourself into into their um, headspace and to to realize that zoos are all about um, exotic the exoticness of you know foreign lands and like zoos mm. and, and menageries have this history of you know um, taking animals from other places and bringing bring them to one place because they're exotic and then mm -hmm. you kind of realize that for early pioneers their whole world was exotic like they mm -hmm. had been transplanted from their place and they were surrounded by things things that are exotic like mm -hmm. um <coughs> let's break down one of your pieces is sure. there one that you'd like to talk about Pakchu, Pakchu. um and what, what does that mean it is uh the name of these small uh game pieces um, so the site is like, um, 
I think the reason that I'm probably the most excited about it is that it has to do with like my Asian heritage, my Chinese heritage, mm-hmm. which like being doing public art and given being given a site and having the inspiration come from the site. I don't always get to choose the subject matter. Like the site kind of tells me yeah. What, yeah, yeah. what it's going to be about. It's in Burnaby. It's um, the home of the Burnaby Art Gallery um, right by mm-hmm. the Shepel Center there. Mm-hmm. Um, the site is like kind of steeped in history and it's there's sort of these three dominant um, narratives on site. It's kind of early pioneer agriculture um, and the, the mansion that was there, which is uh, was owned by the Sepperly family um, and it was kind of their resort home. Uh, mm-hmm. which is now the home of the Burnaby Art Gallery, to houses the Burnaby Art Gallery. And then there's this narrative about the Century Garden, which was created for, um, for in celebration of uh, the centennial of, of uh, the Canadian Confederation. So, <clears throat> so these kind of three, and you know, there's, there's signs about this everywhere. And uh, this tiny note on one of the signs was about, uh, mentions how some, artifacts were found underneath one of the buildings that was being renovated. So in the 1990s, um, for like heritage preservation, one of the buildings was being, the foundation was being worked on and it was being renovated. And underneath that building, they found two um, whiskey bottles with Chinese writing on them and one um, Chinese game piece. Um, And so kind of like this discovery a long time ago kind of like changes how you look at the site. So it, you know, it encourages discovery and curiosity and like, how did these pieces get there? And what do they mean? And so these pieces are, they're called Chu pieces, which is where the name comes from. And actually, yeah, so I have some here. I don't know, you can see them, but there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they were a lot like poker chips, yeah. um, but they were um, used by early Chinese immigrants um, in games of chance found a lot around labor camps, um, railroad labor camps. And so shifts your idea of the site and you start to think about like, how does that inform these three dominant narratives that we already know about? And and it turns out that, you know, early agriculture was only happened, was only made possible because of land clearing and, and seasonal labor. And that was Chinese labor. Digging a little bit deeper, a lot of the money that was used to build the mansion was um, was railway money. Um, it came from uh, mm. the f- uh, members of the family were um, involved in land clearing and uh, and engineering for tunneling. We know that there's a really strong connection between that labor force uh, that was able to facilitate those tunnels were, was Chinese labor. So that you know mm. this this indirect flow of money being able to build this mansion on site and then the and then the final narrative is is about century garden itself and um you know this celebration of 100 years of confederation what does that 100 years look like doesn't look the same for everyone specifically for the chinese population the first 100 years there was a lot of really racially motivated um, immigration policies and Mm -hmm. um, the chinese exclusion act happened during that time and and as it turns out uh racially specific um Chinese or immigration law didn't change until the same year that the Centennial Garden was built. So that first hundred years really was looked a lot different for that community. So kind of layer all those narratives on top. So you're paying homage to people who have been buried, literally buried under other narratives like colonial narratives. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one way to look at it, but I, I think I was trying to be really celebratory in tone mm-hmm. at the same time of, mm-hmm. you know, like these these were the hurdles of this early community. And, and despite all of this, you know, they were able to do some incredible things and have some really incredible impacts on the larger community. The food production um, that they like, despite being marginalized in the way that they were, they were producing like, mass amounts of food and feeding like like the lower mainland it was really Mm -hmm. quite incredible it was about like adding this other I guess adding or uncovering however you want to talk about it but uh, this other narrative to the site and bringing it to the surface so you know for me it was about uh, uh, it's about scale and 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 distribution so taking these two pieces that 
you know, are really small and supersizing them. So, mm. and then sort of redistributing them on site and layering, like adding, like physically adding a layer, another layer to the site. It couldn't have been um, more supported by the people that were working with on it. What advice do you have for your younger self about becoming an artist? What do you wish um, you knew when you were younger that you know now? If I was to give myself advice, then I would be taking away the experience of earning that advice, if that makes any sense. Like, I'm a big fan of failure, um, like, and being okay with failure and learning from those experiences. Like, I mean, I think maybe that's the message is like to just be okay with not nailing it every time, you know, like, being okay with learning from your mistakes. What you're saying about failure is so, so, so important. And so many successful people say that. My road to where I'm at right now has been really um, non-linear, you know? Yeah. Like this, so I'm working on, on this exhibit at the Museum of Vancouver, like co-curating an exhibit. And mm -hmm. that's not something that as, as at all in the realm of public art, but like, I guess the journey is really like never ending, you know, like, and it's not, it's not my, my experiences have not been linear. Well, I think that's, that's great advice. Can you assign us a yeah. art prompt? My prompt is mm -hmm. um, to find a place uh, and you can find it either e either selecting a place or like throwing a dart at a map, mm -hmm. um, some a place that you know nothing about, and researching that place and finding something that you didn't know before. So if it's a place that you're familiar with, um, you're gonna have to work harder to find something that you didn't know about it. Um, and something it should be something that is the more local and the more specific, the better. It's great to know about kind of the history of Vancouver, but to know about the history of a block on in Vancouver is, is or Victoria or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's the, the, the more local and the more specific, I think that's where the, the magic can happen. Um, and then it should be something that kind of reframes how you think about that particular place. Okay, so it could, it could be it could be a drawing, it could be a painting. Absolutely, it could yeah. be a sculpture. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Nathan Lee, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me at uh, contexture.ca, um, and that's it because there's no social media or anything like that. And why is there no social media? I it's it's not something I um, it's not something that comes to me naturally. So. Yeah. Yeah, so there's lots more projects that we did not discuss, and you can find those um, 